Thank you for joining us today. This is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizen based forum where we look at issues of interest to the Tri Cities. First, I'd like to thank Tri Cities Community TV for making this program possible. Before we get started with today's interview, I'd like to acknowledge that this program is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Coquitlam First Nations. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to take care of these lands and all that is above and below. Today we're talking to Hunter Madsen who is running for council in Port Moody. So Hunter, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, always nice to see you. And, and you as well. Um, <laughs> so much for pleasantries. <laughs> Go um, ahead. So, you're running for city council uh, in Port Moody. My question to you is, well, uh, first I think I'd like uh, the people who are watching today to learn a little bit more about you and your past. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I am running for my second full term, uh, Port Moody Council. Um, and, you ha and you had won a term before that. Yeah, I won the I meant a special by-election just uh, right. just prior to that when uh, Rick Glumack's seat was vacated and went uh, became the MLA. Okay. <clears throat> and he endorsed me and I won that. So I've been um, going at this for about 5 years um, and I'm looking for another term. Um, my background, I guess people would want to know I'm not a professional politician. I had no dreams of becoming a city politician. Um, <clears throat> but a bit, I got engaged uh, early on when I moved to the city because I was concerned about what looked like an effort to put a uh, high traffic corridor through uh, the city's largest and arguably nicest nature park, get getaway park, to serve a possible dense development uh, on the far side of the park in the uh, most wildfire prone, a dangerous place to be putting density. And <clears throat> these two things concern me. Um, uh, so, so I got involved and I uh, started a, uh, what turned out to be a 2000 uh, member um, <clears throat> movement in the community to protect the park, to remove the right of way that was gonna be put through there. Um, and also protect uh, that far end as, as best we could of the city from getting too much density in the wrong spot and making uh, sort of the transportation life, the people living along uh, the Ioko Road, uh, a misery. Yeah, so what you're talking about is a possible development on the Ioko lands. Correct. Right. Correct. Which, which are on both in Port Moody and Anmore. And so I got involved uh, uh, mainly to see um, that if the public was interested in protecting it, it had a chance to speak up. It did speak up in one of the largest community um, um, uh, <clears throat> briefing exercises, polling exercises for projects of this sort, and the public clearly wanted to protect it, and it took five years, so we got to protect it. Anyway, so that, I got into politics um, <clears throat> with that cause in mind. I have a green background. I'm a life member of the Sierra Club and uh, had done work for the Green Party before and worked with Force of Nature, which is endorsing me at this time. Um, <clears throat> but um, I did not understand how city government worked. I only knew that I loved Port Moody. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And I wanted to make sure that as we grow, and we are going to grow, that we do it in balance. <clears throat> I mean, you just can't add people without adding corresponding civic services, without figuring out what that does to the roadways, which are already identified as the number one problem in, in survey after survey of our public. They're deeply worried. Something like 90% of the public says that it is worried. 80% says it's deeply worried about the livability of the downtown area as we densify. These are big warning signs. You almost never get percentages of people responding that high. Right. I guess I should also say, by way of background, um, I'm originally a social scientist. I have a doctorate um, in, um, in work that sort of straddled government. I have my PhDs in government. Um, but I was also interested in um, the social psychology of people working together, in influence and that kind of thing. And this has been a tremendous test study, that the way the city works, um, to, 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 to see uh, some of these forces uh, sort of in action. Right, right. Um, so I, I'm really interested in what you're talking about with regards to the growth of the city. And if you don't mind, I'd like to go a little farther into that and um, understand more of what you think the city should look like in terms of that kind of growth. 
Be because quite often we hear that um, communities in the past have made a commitment to, I'm not sure who they made the commitment to, but they've made a commitment to growth. Okay. So <clears throat> Port Moody, are they made a commitment to growth, presumably. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll answer. Okay. Um, the, uh, we should be growing, but we should be cr growing according to an agreed plan, the plan that the community endorsed. Um, in 2014, uh, after a lot of back and forth, it was not an easy decision, but the community agreed to a target of growing from 35,000 th then to uh, 50,000 in the year 2041. Um, <clears throat> if you have a, a gradual a pace of growth like that, that's not slow. You're practically adding 50% of your population in 20 years, and people really feel that. Um, but nonetheless, if you've got a modulated path like that, and you're not just doubling and tripling without th uh, giving thought to the rest of things the city needs, you have the time to figure out, okay, if the population will be 50,000, then how many jobs do we need to have ready for those people? Uh, what's the park capacity we need to have? Because you have to expand parkland to have the ratio of parkland to people um, stay, uh, stay livable. Um, <clears throat> you know, what does it do to your, how big does the library have to be? How many more feet does it need? How much more rec space do we need? These are all questions you can figure out in a systematic way if you have a clear target. But if you're just overbuilding right and left and saying yes to every big project that comes to town, and you're not having those other conversations about keeping the rest of the city up with that pace, you're in deep trouble, and we're in deep trouble. The, uh, the, the council has, uh, again and again, um, the, basically the pro-build forces on the council, Megan Lottie, Diana Dilworth, uh, Zoe Royer, who's left now, again and again have basically deflected conversations about proper planning for the rest of the city and have <clears throat> leaned in favor of basically green lighting all the giant projects coming their way. The reason why I'm so concerned about that um, is that it relates to the question of conflict on the council. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, and in fact, Megan Lottie is trying to leverage the idea that there was a problem this past year, people weren't being nice to each other. But really, the conflict over and over again was over development. And if you take a look at the long-time incumbents on the council and you uh, ask what's different about them and uh, what, how they came into office than the newcomers like me, um, uh, like Councillor Lubick, um, uh, Mayor Vagramoff, and Councillor Milani, the difference can be summarized here. This is a, <clears throat> a chart that shows uh, the share of all the campaign funds, of, of their campaign funding in the 2018 election that came from business development interests that are bringing business in front of their council for approval. Now, what you see is a very striking difference. <laughs> These people, uh, Dilworth Yunker, uh, Barbara Yunker, Megan Lottie, and Mike Clay, principally have funded their, their campaign and their careers based on the money of people who are going to want them to say yes to property development decisions on council. These people came in with almost no uh, obligation or connection to special interests. It is inevitable that when you have conflicts this sharp over the future of growth, that sparks are going to fly, obedience are going to get frayed, and people are going to start um, you know, pointing fingers at personal reasons or blaming it on gender or something like that. Right. So, so this, um, the, the chart that you're showing right now, like that's a pretty, those are pretty specific um, numbers and uh, yeah. it, there's quite a contrast there. It's very shocking. And so it, it is. I, I, did, I, didn't, so I didn't know this question, until I ran the numbers. So my question, I have to ask this because nobody there can speak for themselves in this particular moment. Mm -hmm. Where does this information come from? This comes directly from their own filings with Elections BC. It's been triple checked. It involves, in fact, we've given them every possible um, concession. We've counted everything they could possibly put in to their totals so as not to make the part that was developer linked look uh, bigger. The, these is the smallest, no, smallest numbers we could come to. They'd probably in actuality be much higher. Okay. So. All right. That, so 
that's thrown me for a little bit of a loop in this conversation. And well, it threw me for a loop in how I thought about what was going on in council. Okay. Because these people, in almost every single case, were green lighting the projects of developers. Not necessarily the ones who gave them money, oh. but the orientation is yes, yes, yes. And these people were very much concerned with negotiating the best benefit for the public. So uh, w w when, we, when we push back on what developers were offering, what people like Councillor Lottie have said is you're just being obstructionist. You're being too hard on the developer. You're moving the goalposts. You know, this is just a natural process of negotiation, but these folks d want to do it less, it seems to me, than these folks, and there's, that's where you get your conflict. Okay. We, so, okay. So, I, I, this is shocking information, but excellent information for all voters to be aware of. But I don't want to make this conversation just about that. No, me neither. But Can we you, go to an hour? <laughs> do, <laughs> I, we we got to limit ourselves. Okay. But so, um, ha, having heard that, um, and I'm not trying to dismiss it, Hunter. But no. what I want to talk about no. is the conversations between council, because this is something that we've brought up and we've yeah. got issues in the past. Right. This is a big issue, how we talk to each other. And we've heard people address that uh, about conversations being respectful. They need right. to be respectful. Yeah. And we've heard that people don't think that they've been respectful. Mm. Yeah. What's your position on that? Uh, well, <clears throat> I would say, uh, looking back, there were conversations, some that I got involved in, where we all got heated, and I regret that I got snappish or whatever. Um, it, it is, however, you know, respect is a two-way street. It's not just a one-way street going the direction of the of Megan Lottie and, and the folks. It, it, um, if, if you watched the council meetings, if you actually spent time watching the council meetings, what you would see um, is that um, a few players um, uh, were going at it with each other all the time. The mayor and Diana Torth, it was constant. Uh, Megan Lottie, a little less so, me a little less so, but we also disagreed on stuff now and then. But I, I don't know, I, I think we pulled back from it. The people who are really not engaged in the conflict in any kind of snappish uh, back and forth uh, uh, engage, I interaction was, I think, Councilor Lubick and Councilor Milani. The two of them are very even keel. Um, you know, they stood the ground and so forth, but they're always respectful. Um, so, you know, I, I do think um, style is a question here, um, but I also think um, there was uh, coming into that particular council a lot of anger and a lot of hostility, um, which just kept misfiring and refiring and getting hooked to the mayor's problems and so forth. Okay. So anyway, I don't think I don't think it's necessary. I, it's not the style, It's not the way I want to be having a council meeting again. Right. And I think I I don't know if I told you, um, you know, I, I seriously questioned whether I would run again because I just I can't take another council like that. We just got to get it together and be civil, which is my instinct. And okay, it's so that's it's good because I, I want to I want to move away from this topic and talk about other issues that you think the city has. But I want to finish this little portion with one one question. What what is it that you and everyone can do to lower that temperature? <clears throat> well, I actually think the main thing, um, well, well, two things. First, there's a process thing. One thing that made every made the engagements are so heated is there's something called point of order. It's a yellow cuff. And it's the one thing you can do in a process to basically throw the brakes on whatever anybody's saying or doing. Because you have an issue that's specific to the procedure. But actually, people started throwing the yellow card whenever they wanted to interject a comment. It got worse and worse and worse. And soon it felt like a free-for-all. The mayor was trying to manage the meeting, became frustrated, kept saying, you're out of order, you're out of order. That started to feel like he was shouting. Um, it kind of, I, so I think if people follow the rules about things like basic meeting etiquette and procedure, and you don't, you don't throw cards that, that aren't really valid and you know it and so forth, I think that's a, a good start. Um, the second thing is just not to focus on individual personalities. It, this should be about the policies. Um, and I, I think as we're just, a lot of the discussion and the back and forth in this very difficult trying term seemed to be challenging um, the character of people 
um, you know, question their integrity and that kind of thing. It got really personal all the way through, through the, the term, and miserably so. And um, I could absolutely do with that. If I never see that kind of thing again on council, it'll be too soon. Okay, Thank, yeah. thanks for that. Okay, really thanks for that. that there's, that's really, um, there's a lot of insight that comes with that. Uh, let's just move on to what you, what you, going forward in the city, what are, what are going to be your, what's your platform? What are, what are the things that you want to see in this, the, the happier thing? <laughs> let's go to the happier yeah. thing. Thanks for starting the interview. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's, well, let's, let's move on. So, um, one thing I said at the beginning of my first term, uh, I, I told um, voters in my materials and I told people at council, is I said the next two terms are going to, in the decisions that council is going to have to be making, it's, are going to set um, the destiny of the city probably for the next century. Because we're making giant decisions about neighborhoods that are going to be completely rebuilt. And once they're rebuilt, they're going to stay that way for a good long time, for mm -hmm. decades and decades. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about things like density and growth, we had better be making the right plays and have thought through what the cumulative impacts are. So what I would say is that... <clears throat> Uh, I, I, I just like my, my little notes here. First of all, <clears throat> keep growing to the plan that the community approved. It's good, vigorous growth, um, <clears throat> and it will get us to 50,000 uh, in 2041. I want to point out just, that... Just help me with this. When was that plan approved? 2014. 2014. Yeah. yeah. So it hasn't been in action very much. We, we already have approved, just in the last term, you know, we were certainly not anti-growth. We've, we've already greenlit the building of enough new construction that we can basically hit that target um, and not approve any more uh, for, for the next 20 years. Now, we wouldn't do that, but it's a real crisis for our city because we have so much, we have so many big development proposals in the, in the pipeline. Um, Port Moody is one of the hottest markets, development markets, in all of the Lower Mainland now. And so all the developers want to get in on the action. We have so many people um, lined up to propose huge projects that we could be doubling the city. That's an entire second Port Moody crashing down on our first little Port Moody in just 20 years. Um, and we're already more densely packed than Coquitlam as of today. So, so the question is, what's the pacing going to look like? Then the second question is, and this has been my focus in the first term, are we going to leave enough space in the downtown areas? Because we only have a, you know, poor Moody. It's not a very big space downtown. Will we leave, let's say, 2.7, 2.8 million square feet, which is what we'll need to house 10 to 15,000 new jobs there in new sustainable industries so that the city doesn't end up uh, in its grim destiny, it's just a bedroom city with horrible finances, a dead daytime economy, and no tax base so we can pay for amenities and so forth. That's where we're headed. So for the last four years, I've been working, I've been leading the charge to revitalize the city's economy, but that means we have to make different density decisions. Instead of just asking for population density, we need to be asking for jobs density. We need to make spaces for office spaces and for light industry and so forth. That needs to be the number one priority to get this, uh, the economy back in balance. The number one, density comes second. Um, next, I'll just race sure. through these and yeah, you'll be done. You're fine. Um, <clears throat> we need, um, the public told us again and again that they never moved to Port Moody so they could become another metro town or another Yale town. Big concrete towers. It's not what they wanted. And so they, uh, so I'm concerned that the plans coming to us to pack as much density and profit into the Port Moody downtown as possible are just all glass and concrete towers. And there's something like 50 of them that could be lined up. We've got about 10 or 12 now. They could be going to ha you know, half a hundred in just the next uh, 20 years. So, you, you, Sorry. I'm sorry. So we need a, a human scaled skyline, more livable. We, the, the forms need to be lower, and they should be, because concrete towers are the absolute worst built form for climate change. They're, be, they're absolutely worse in terms of GHG production, in terms of the cost of heating and air conditioning, because they're all glass. Um, they, they are an ecological disaster, and why we should ever consider building any of them when we could be building our density into lower mid rise mass timber 
number I cannot fathom, but a lot of people who claim to be ecologically oriented, like Councilor Lottie, are the first ones in line to green light this. Is, so, uh, I'm going to ask you to please let's not yeah. speak for anybody else while we're doing this, okay. but um, if that's fair. Okay. Because um, uh, so let, let me talk about other things. Then. All right. All right. Uh, we, we need affordable housing. Um, and the way you get that is not what the industry has been claiming, which is, oh, just build more housing. Uh, the problem isn't number of houses. We actually are on track with our population. We're, we're, building, we're, we're building more housing in uh, the Vancouver area than any other part of North America faster. It's fastest in history. That's not the problem. The problem is it's not affordable. And the source of unaffordability is land value escalation that, in fact, developers um, and local homeowners are participating in. That means all that new cost people pay for land gets to have to get forwarded in the cost of new housing. So the way to control that is to do pre-zoning of neighborhoods to say, you can have the density, but you've got to guarantee 30% affordability. And the cost of buying the land has to reflect the fact you have to make room for the cost of the affordability. So that's okay. I, I have other things I could talk about too. No, I'm looking for so I'm, I just want a little explanation of that because yeah, um, because I think that's really an interesting point, but I don't understand it. Okay. Um, how does a developer? How does the cost of land reflect the density? Um, uh, well, that Am is I asking that properly. Well, no, yeah, you're asking the right question, um, and I can. I can answer it depending on how much time we have left. What I would really recommend is people who are interested in it should go look up the work of Patrick Condon, who's a UBC economist um, and, a sort of, and a density expert, urban planning expert, mm -hmm. who's actually sort of cracked the code. He was saying, why do costs keep going up? Why do home, we keep building more units, but they keep getting more expensive. And he realized that what was happening was um, Land assemblers were coming to people's homes um, who were perfectly happy living in their single family home, like their neighborhood, and so forth. They're knocking on the door and they're saying, You know, we could put a six story or maybe a 20 story building where your home is. That means we get all those floors that we can make money on. So instead of paying you a million dollars for your property, we'll pay you two or three. So it's a huge windfall for the landowner. It gets them to sell the land, but in paying them so much, and now they find out what their neighbors are making, everybody's starting to get really greedy because it's this huge landfall. The land price, the whole neighborhood goes sky high. That cost actually does affect the performa of the developer. It becomes a huge roadblock to affordability. You have to build luxury condos. That's what makes financial sense when you've paid through the nose for the land. Right. So what you need to do is you need to go into neighborhoods that haven't already been sort of converted by the land assemblers and dollar signs in their eyes, you have to say, um, uh, this neighborhood, like, say, Coronation Park, had been a, pretty much all affordable housing. Now it has no affordable with the decision the council made. Um, the, uh, say, for the part of it that hasn't been developed yet, say, if you're going to develop this area, we're fine with density, but it's got to be 30% affordable up front. And that's the only way you can bake the pro forma so it's going to work for the developer and work for the community. Did I ever explain that? No, no, no. I think I think I get it. It's it's what it's doing is, tell me if I'm wrong. It's making sure that there's affordability in the formula. Correct. You know that up front because if you don't, what we're getting on average from developers just left to their own devices is six percent of the units are affordable. I'm sorry, ninety-four percent of the units not being affordable for low and middle income people does not create a complete community. Right. It's not fair, and you'll have people on the streets. Right. So uh, we can't set, settle for that. We've uh, put a minimum of fifteen percent, but it's not what our housing assessment says we need. Yeah. We need thirty to fifty percent affordable. Right. So some some strong measures are going to have to be taken to get there. So you really, you really have measures that will achieve affordability. Oh, yes. Well, we have some minimums that will help. But yes, the, the idea is to move to pre-zoning to okay. require affordability. Okay. This is great. We need to move on because we're yeah. running out of okay. time. Okay. So um, other things. Uh, the past term, I co-chaired the Parks and Rec uh, Commission for much of the time. And I led the full protection of Bird Flynn Park 
removing the right of way permanently um, and unifying that park so it stays intact instead of having that traffic corridor forced mm. through the middle of it to serve a really badly located uh, dense heat island in a wildfire zone. Um, so the next, uh, the, the next step is uh, working to extend Rocky Point Park west along the shoreline um, and expanding uh, other parks and key growth areas. My big fear is most of the new development projects that we're looking at, like Flavel, uh, like the Moody Center TOD right next to it, uh, like Coronation Park just, just up the street, Westport's not that far either. Um, we're looking, we could easily be looking at adding 15 to 20,000 people with walk-in access to this one little park. This park is nine acres, okay? Yeah. And the shoreline's a little bigger. But talk about a recipe for ruining the central asset of the city. The thing that people most love about the city mm -hmm. is Rocky Point Park. So um, my, my view is you have to expand that park and you also need to do an assessment of what the capacity limits of that park are. They weren't doing that in the staff. Now I have them working on it. We don't have an answer yet. We'll know next term. Okay. But once we have those limits, once we know what capacity limits are that we can't change, we start need to start saying no to additional density around it or we will ruin the central asset of the city. Okay. We, we only have a couple more minutes. Okay. So anything else that we um, want the, to address? I, I guess the other thing I'll mention is um, the fact that traffic, uh, local traffic really limits growth inherently. Um, there's been a tendency on the council, um, I, I encountered when I first got on council, people saying, oh, traffic, nothing you can do about that. It's all, you know, it's through the region and half the traffic is through commuters. What can you do? Shrug your shoulders. And people think it's a regional issue. Exactly, it's regional. And of course, part of it is regional. Half of that traffic right now, but only half right now, um, is people trying to get through to to uh, other parts of the Northeast sector. But in reality, um, we have traffic at a certain level now, which people say it's the worst thing about the city. It's already really bad. The gridlock times are 30, 40 minute wait times through the city. Mm -hmm. um, that's now. So, um, what, you know, 30%. What, yes, once you've added, as we just said yes to, 10 or 15,000 more residents at the worst choke point of the city, which is Ioko and St. John's. And it's the worst choke point for the whole region because this is a conduit drivers take to get home uh, when they're not taking the low to Highway 1. So, so if we do not start saying no to putting people right in that spot who have no choice, they can't ride around the city. The three commuters can all say, I give up, and, and uh, Google will tell them to go someplace else. These people live there. So we have to, we've got to stop waving this problem away, and we need to research how much the increased drive time is going to be with every big project we add, and draw a line and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to let our average commuters have to spend more than an hour in a car each, each way, okay. twice a day. Hunter, I, it's unfortunate we've run out of time because uh, it looks like you have a really fabulous, <laughs> you know uh, really, I it looks you. like you've done your homework it's or maybe a, something like um, that. <laughs> um, but it's been good. And I really appreciate you coming. And um, I'm so sorry I was late. It was it, just last minute. I appreciate um, you taking the time to come and talk to us. I know you have a lot to do at this time. So thank you for so being much. here. Hopefully we can talk to you again about these things and, uh, and learn a lot more. Thanks for everything. Thank you, Brad. This has been We've Got Issues. Thanks to Tri-City Community TV for sponsoring these, um, sponsoring our little show, and thank you for watching.